Well, 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 I'm back. Last time I was here, I was all alone. It was fabulous. But we're not here for that. Let's start over here. I want to go and visit just a few locations that I think some people have not been to. Some people have been to, but haven't given enough information. And some places I've not been to before. So kind of brand new to me as well. In my first video, I started here. Now, the whole Mersey beat was given birth. I think Skiffle was on the way out. I know that the Quarrymen had kind of started as a Skiffle band and pretty quickly started moving into the rocker. Certainly once George got on board with the Quarrymen because of his guitar style um, and several of the members leaving, which by the way, I've done a bit of reading on the Quarrymen and it's an interesting story as a kind of prefab for I know the Ruttles were the prefab four, but we, we could have a prefab five or six, you know, with people coming and going when there were only three left, three guitarists. And um, when asked, why don't you have a drummer? <laughs> the real Aunt Mimi knows the answer. The rhythm's in the guitars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't get it. The real Aunt Mimi when you wrote that comment on my other video. I get it now, because I've done some reading. <laughs> nice quote. Anyway, Bob Wooler, he started um, what's called the Fish and Chip Cruise Suppers. And so he would commission the ferry boats that would sail across from Pierhead to Birkenhead. And he would hire bands to perform on the Fish and Chip Cruises and entertain the people. And for three or four hours, they would sail up and down the Mersey here. The Royal Iris used to sail across the, across the way and they would have the dance bands. Now what's happened to the Royal Iris? If you've seen my little two minute snippet video, <laughs> you'll know. But I'm gonna take us to, Lon to London. So let's just nip over there now. Let's do a crossfade. The Royal Iris had a dance floor and a stage and a fish and chip bar <laughs> and the cavern club would run the four hour cruises up and down the mersey on the royal iris it's very much uh, dilapidated now it left the service of the ferry company in 1991 and was bought by a welsh company who took it down to cardiff they ran it for a short time as a nightclub and a casino but as you can see, it's rather past it now. But just to think, the Beatles played four gigs on this boat. And now it just sits here all forlorn on the River Thames. Paul McCartney um, namesaked it in his 2007 album, Memory Al Almost Full. That was me, he said. Was it something like, that was me? Uh, the Royal Iris on the river, Mersey beaten with the band. That was me. Wow. All those Liverpool bands performing on here. Look at it, all the water lapping up on the stern. It's, it's, it's sad. So a, a bit of a departure from <laughs> the Liverpool trip. It's like I've um, teleported down to London just to show you the Royal Iris. It still exists, 70 years on. So, um, Back to Liverpool. So the MV Royal Iris still exists, albeit in a dilapidated state. I think I know a billionaire who could, you know, bring it back to life, but I think, you know, he might say, that was yesterday. <laughs> anyway, I've got lots and lots to do. I really have to try and get as much in as possible. Filming locations, historical locations, locations that I've never been to before. No matter where you go in the UK, in whatever city you're in, you'll still always find, even though they're being redeveloped and refurbished, and, and quite rightly so, because, you know, we're progress, you'll, you'll still always find remnants of an old city. Now, on a strip of land here, between Saltney Street, the other side, and this, Dublin, Dublin Street, 28th of September, 1962, one week before Love Me Do was released, the Beatles came up and did a photo shoot and they stood on a, what was then a strip of land between the two streets and there's a, an iconic photograph of the lads with this building, you know, behind them. And it's purported that John was standing on the location where his ancestors had settled after the um, 
the famine in Ireland and they'd kind of, I, I want to say emigrated, but it's only Ireland to the UK, isn't it? They'd come over to the UK. But John was stood where they had settled. So I wonder if, you know, the, the, this building was used to house people. This is the old dock of Liverpool. So, um, you know, all the merchant ships would come along and all the wares would be stored in the warehouses. So yeah, an iconic photograph of the Beatles standing in front of this. Like I said in my London video, it was always black and white. I've always got this, this feeling of kind of oldie worldy. I saw a picture recently of McCartney and, and um, Jay Nasher with Ringo and Maureen, 1964, somewhere in the Caribbean. I <laughs> just like that looked like modern day. But you, you know, you compare two years from September 1962 to that picture, <laughs> a stark difference. On the 19th of February 1963, a month and five days after I was born, <laughs> the Beatles stood here. Michael Ward, a photographer for uh, pop magazine Honey, had been commissioned to take a series of photographs of the lads standing here, Pierhead, the NEMS office, just out and about around Liverpool. And he captured a shot, if I can get it there, something like that. I'll superimpose the, um, the picture. But what it was, the, um, it was the coldest winter that the UK had experienced for 200 years. And so while the lads were having their photographs taken, they were kind of not interested. Michael Ward is reported to have said that he didn't know who they were. You know, who is this up and coming band? You know, I don't know the, the Beatles. <laughs> Little did he know, because later that evening, when he was at the Cavern Club, Bob Wooler made an announcement that um, the, that coming Friday, the Beatles, please, please me, would be number one, which apparently caused a bit of a stir for the, um, for the audience at the Cavern that night because some of them were just really quiet and the, uh, the thing was that they felt they had lost their Beatles and the Beatles went to bed that night as pop stars. And Michael Ward is um, reported as saying that not only was he disinterested but they were disinterested and he took a shot of them across here. Across here was the um, zebra crossing um, and he said the, sh the shot was spoiled because um, Ringo John hit, uh, Paul hit behind Ringo, so he, he missed the shot. Yeah, there's a shot of them walking along the ramp of the, what, what would be a level crossing. But there's no level crossing there anymore. Here comes the rain. It's going to be like this all day long. Um, yeah, M Michael Ward said he was kind of disinterested in, in them as they were in him because fans had started arriving and John was chatting with the fans and kind of not engaging with the photographer. Oh, I was going to bring my brolly, I left it in the car, but I've got my hat. Down there is the town hall. So let's just head down there and have a quick look at the balcony. So on the 10th of July, 1964, the Beatles arrived here at the town hall for a civic reception for the Northern premiere of A Hard Day's Night. And they had, um, arrived at Speak Airport and had a, a procession from Speak Airport all the way into Liverpool with approximately 200,000 people dotting the, the route along the way. Some fabulous photographs of the whole event. And when they got here, this whole street was filled with about 20,000 people coming to see them. I'm guessing that they would have had cameramen up in the buildings up up at the top taking pictures down on the looking down on the town hall now, i can't really superimpose a picture because i'm not high enough so yeah civic reception for the lads they they return the boys are coming home right i'm going to go down here and see what's down there okay so we'll get it right this time the cavern is actually demolished the new cavern, there's John. The Wall of Fame, it's nicer now that I don't actually have 
a van standing inside. So last time I was here, I got it wrong. I said this was the cavern. This is the sister pub. The cavern is actually there. The original entrance I've read, which was demolished, is here where the Scylla Black statue is. So yeah, here's the um, original. It is quite nice actually walking up here knowing that it's got a vibe for all the music. Right, that's enough of that. <laughs> I've been in there once, but as I say, there's, there's plenty of videos on the internet about inside the cavern. And one could argue that because the original cavern's gone, is that actually the cavern for the Beatles? But you know what, if McCartney can play there with Dave Gilmore, then that makes it the cavern, doesn't it? <laughs> I'm surprised how the more I visit, everything seems to be, you know, more in the same place. The last time I was here, I was like driving round and round, going round and round the streets, and actually, I should have just parked up, which I've done now, and walked to all the locations. So Faulkner Street, um, John and Cynthia had their first place, which is in the first video. And across the road from Faulkner Street is Rice Street. We've got the Crack Pub. We've got the Institute of Art and, oh, the, is it the, the Liverpool College of Institute? Oh, right. Liverpool Institute of Performing Arts. <laughs> That's the one. However, just at the junction up here is Three Gambia Terrace. So let's go there first and we'll walk our way back, back to the car and we'll hit off these locations all in one go. So in the shadows of rather foreboding Anglican Cathedral of Liverpool, which looks foreboding on a day like today, just through here is Gambia Terrace. And it was here that John had his first taste of independent life, having left Aunt Mimi. And obviously it's private residence now. But you've got three Gambia Terrace. And he stayed here with Stuart Sutcliffe. And you had the likes of um, Paul and George coming around here to practice, do their sort of music stuff. There's a rather nice old picture of John with some fellow students just around about here. It's a nice big Range Rover in the way, so if I just kind of park the camera there and see if I can superimpose that one shot with John. So we didn't actually have far to go to get to Art College because it's just across the road there, as you can see down the lane. So yeah, Gambia Terrace, the college there, and the crack pub on Rice Street. So let's head down to the college there. It must have been very liberating for John to start attending college. College is so unlike school. I remember my college days and it's there's, there's a liberation, a, a feeling of, you know, you, you, you've all grown up. But you know what? You're 16, 17, 18, whatever it may be. <laughs> when you go to college after school, but you don't have to wear a uniform. You know, in the UK, it's all uniforms. And you start developing your own identity. And I think John started doing that here. So we had Paul and George attending the boys' school, Liverpool School for Boys. And we had John at the College for Performing Arts. Well, it's performing arts now, but it was an art college then because old Paul bought it, didn't he? Liverpool, oh, <laughs> Mechanics Institute. But I, I've got, got it in my head that there's a picture. Is it around about here? On this street here with John sitting on an old Ford Poplar with Cynthia and some more students. I think we're in for a rainy day. This is going to be a rainy tour of Liverpool. The Beatles in the rain. <laughs> There's a song, song there somewhere, isn't there? 
when the rain comes they run and hide their head okay let's not hide our head then John here's Rice Street here we go now down here is the crack pub where John and Stuart would come and you have to remember that there are significant locations relating to the Beatles like the cavern the Casbah but the crack pub this is where the Beatles I think John set up he wanted to form a band I can't remember if it was a, a literary editorial group he wanted to set up or another band the dissenters now this is where John came when he found out that his mum Julia died and there's a picture of John here I'm going to superimpose the picture the crack pub when you see a ye you don't say ye it's the it's just the old scripting from Elizabethan era kind of shorthand a T and an H was shortened to a Y so you still say the not ye anyway look at this writing on the wall Eggman Eggman all you need is love I'm not normally one for people scribbling on walls but that's kind of appropriate one of these hidden gems because everyone's going to visit the Beatles story oh this this umbrella's had it I'm gonna go what am I talking about now everyone's going to visit all the usual locations aren't they but do they go to the crack pub probably not oh no <laughs> I've had to resort to the brolly because it's checking it down now but that's not going to stop us right I'm on an, a, an insignificant road it would seem it's a very busy road that's for sure and people are parking on the on the pavements are you allowed to do that in Liverpool anyway something down here you need to see number 38 Kingston and here it is here it's got a picture of the Beatles look birthplace of the Beatles it says and the plaque it's the quarry men the plaque commemorates the recording here of the Quarrymen's first disc. So what occurred here on the 12th of July 1958, the Quarrymen turned up at Percy Phillips' place. I'll hold the um, camera there. Now Percy Phillips had, um, it was a, a record store in his front, front room here and he had a recording studio in the back, at, back uh, in the middle room I'm going to go across the road and we'll get a better um, view of it John Paul George Colin Hanton and John Lowe came here and they cut their first disc side A was that'll be the day and side B in spite of all the danger McCartney and Harrison composition and they put a quid in each sorry I couldn't do that and get them wet they put a pound in each to the kitty and recorded side A straight to disc to acetate and Percy Phillips has said for an extra pound I can put it onto tape for you and they didn't have an extra pound so it just went straight to disc oh insignificant little room right a uh, little house but the actual first recording it was put onto a 78 rpm acetate disc probably in shellac <laughs> very brittle very fragile and the idea was that they would pass the disc round to one another so that they would all have the disc one week at a time by the time it got round to John Lowe <laughs> the band members never saw the disc again and it was for like another 20 years before it surfaced and McCartney is purported to have paid Two hundred thousand pounds to John Lowe for the for the disc. I don't know if that's true. However, what I do know is that he then had it digitally enhanced, and it was released on the anthology album. Wowie, thirty-eight Grover Road. It's it's just totally insignificant. <laughs> it's it's not your Abbey Road, is it? Just a quick pit stop because we've got. Um, Ringo's birthplace but look what they've done on the side of the Empress they've painted this rather spectacular mural of Ringo because it was his local after all wasn't it 
yellow submarine. It's not a bad likeness, although he looks a bit older than his mop top years there. Um, so it's not on the itinerary for this, for this location, but I was driving up here earlier and I saw it and I thought, you know what? I've just got to capture that and put it in my video. I'm now in Sefton Park, a municipal park in the kind of suburbs of Liverpool. What we have to think about, you know, when we all grew up in our hometowns, um, there were haunts that we would all visit and go to that, you know, we, we never document. <laughs> and I think that there are places in Liverpool that the lads would have gone to throughout their teen years, even before they started quarrymen and things like that. Um, and Sefton Park is probably one of them. And so for many of the locations that um, the Beatles might mention in their songs, and I'm going to take you to one particular one that I think no one's ever been to before. We've got here in Sefton Park an old Victorian bandstand. Can you see it behind me? Now it's, it's suggested that this is an inspiration for McCartney for his Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Because during the Victorian era, bandstands were commonplace in the UK. And I know, you know, where I live, down in Kent, they're, they're dotted all over the place. So it's hard to argue that, yes, this was the inspiration for Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, but you know what? It could well have been. So yeah, the um, bandstand in Sefton Park. Okay, quick pit stop. This isn't Beatle related at all. I want to go down there because down there something is Beatle related. But for now, a quick, quick Jude the Tour Guide pit stop. To my right is Battle Crease House. Battle Crease House was the home of one James Maybrick. Does the name James Maybrick ring a bell? 1992, a former me scrap metal merchant by the name of Michael Barrett received a journal from a friend in a pub. And on opening the journal, he, it, it was a diary and it was the diary of <laughs> purported Jack the Ripper. It detailed all the um, escapades. That's a bad word for it, isn't it? But it detailed the canonical five uh, women who were murdered by Jack the Ripper, all, all the details. It's a fascinating read. Someone actually wrote a book. I'll put a, a little picture of it here. Um, but it put James Maybrick on the map as one of the potential Jack the Rippers Ripperologists scoff, they say no, it, you know, it's just, it isn't to be. I kind of think it might be. <laughs> if, if, you know, Aaron Kosminski and um, Sickert and even the, the Prince Regent or whatever it was, Edward VII, um, I kind of don't buy it. But James Maybrick, it seems plausible to me. So yeah, Battle Crease House. I just had to stop. A <laughs> Tudor the tour guide. Right, I want to take you down here. Let's go. They said it was going to rain. You're getting not much of a tour today, are you? You'll still see the locations. It's just not on a sunny day, is it? Um, one of my subscribers, Dr. Ruzo, when I mentioned about Liverpool, bring a brolly. It's going to be rainy. <laughs> this is the Mersey. Liverpool city centre up there. Anyway, kind of an industrial area throughout the Victorian era. Um, this is actually known, there was a, a, a cast iron foundry up the way. God, I'm having no fun with this today. I kind of don't want to move the umbrella because you're just getting me with an umbrella. Let's put it down. If it gets wet, it gets wet. Just up the way there was a cast iron foundry. So of course they made the iron for their construction. And the residue came out onto the Mersey giving it its color. Now, are you thinking what I'm thinking? There is one particular lyric in a John Lennon song. That's right, Glass Onion. So where I said about um, the city being the playground for the Beatles, I can only imagine that they must have, you know, spent time down along the, so the shore because he sings, standing on the cast iron shore, yeah. Lady Madonna trying to make ends meet, yeah. 
so the Beatles they slip all these little references into their songs which unless you know specifically what they're talking about you'd think well it's gobbledygook it doesn't make any sense at all so now you know standing on the cast iron shore yeah that's what John's talking about ha. I'm going all over this city just for these two minute clip bike things however just as an aside, I wanted to show you the Epstein family residence, which is behind me, 197 Queen's Drive. And I can't work out if this was Brian Epstein's house, as well as Faulkner Street, where he lived. He had the apartment in Faulkner Street. Or whether that was like his mother and father's house. So drop me a comment if you know. But just down here is the five ways junction or roundabout at Childwall and a very iconic photograph was taken on the wall just on the right there so we want to get down there I have my own um, memories of Liverpool I lived here in 1982 for a short while before settling down in Kent but I first came to Liverpool in 1976 I was 13 years old and the family were moving to Europe where we spent two and a half years in Norway, two years in Sweden, maybe nearly three years in Sweden, and, um, and then a year in Germany before coming back to the UK in 82. And we came to Liverpool to say goodbye to my father's brother, sort of spent a week here with them, then went to Wales to say goodbye to family there. As you do when you're going abroad to live, you say goodbye to your nearest and dearest, as if to say, I'll never see you again. Hi Mary in New Zealand, my sister, <laughs> it's been a long time, Debbie in Sweden, my big sister, and Wendy in Ashford, it's been a long time. <laughs> anyway, I had just got into the Beatles vibe, you saw in my other video about the little red turntable, and so songs like From Me To You, I Feel Fine. Um, all my loving all those early songs were like all oh, 13 year old playing them anyway just here in the grounds of the chilled wall five ways hotel there's this brick wall and on this brick wall there's an iconic photograph with the tree of the Beatles as well as Jerry and the pacemakers and I think it was all the bands and acts that Brian Epstein managed and he, he just got them together to, to take a photo shoot on this wall. It's amazing, isn't it? Standing on the location. They must have had a great time, you know, youngsters in their late teens, early 20s. We're gonna be stars. No, hang on a minute. You're already stars. <laughs> you are the, the thing. You've got the X factor. You are the pop idol of the time the lads sat on this wall uh, it's letting up the rain's letting up well this place was easier to find than I thought here we go strawberry field how could I not show you the gates and of course all the scribblings and writings that people leave these are replica gates because the originals were um, stolen but let's go in now strawberry fields was originally an orphanage 1936 sitting at the back of Walton village Walton village is that way man love avenue is just there and John would come in and play games with the kids so whether he came in this way or whether he climbed over the wall who can say his aunt Mimi tried to discourage him from visiting because they were she was concerned that he that, that the whole experience would be a bad influence for him it's quite impressive we're going there and um to try and discourage him she said if you keep going in there john you're going to be hanged <laughs> anyway john would come in he'd play with all the kids and um i think i read somewhere there was a, a roll call you know <laughs> tommy yes here sir Billy, yes, here, sir. Go and went through all the lists, and there was one extra child sitting there. <laughs> it was John. 
<laughs> just playing with all the kids. I'm, I'm walking down the end here to see what it is. I think I've got to go in. So I'm at the end. We'll go in. We'll see what's what. And also walk around the garden. Um, in the song, Strawberry Fields Forever, is of course the line. I think John kind of counter-argued with Mimi on numerous occasions. What are they going to do? Hang me? <laughs> and of course he sings, there's nothing to get hung about. Strawberry Fields Forever. Oh, they've got a cafe, which is good. Okay, here's the deal. It's um, an exhibition and they've got the piano that John composed or played for Imagine. The gardens are free to walk around, so that's worth doing. And the original gates are in there for the strawberry field, so I'll go and have a look at that. But I asked, can I take my GoPro in to the exhibition? Of course you can. So I'm going to have some lunch and then we're going to do the exhibition and I'll walk around. You know, it might be a 10 minute walk around, but I think it's worth putting on the video. So lunch is served. And it's a light lunch, just a bit of soup. <laughs> well, lunch was amazing. It was red pepper, <laughs> pepper bread. So this place is run by the Salvation Army. So you kind of don't mind paying. So what I'm gonna do, rather than waffle on through, I'm just gonna do the walking tour and go through the exhibition and you can just see what's happening.
I think that has made the whole trip coming up here worthwhile. Kind of lost for words. It's, it's really emotional walking through there, you know, seeing the piano, seeing the handwritten lyrics. Ah, and George Martin on the wall there, and the Beatles. And, oh, right, let's go outside and look for the original gate, if only because it existed it's just amazing now it's it's just that it was an orphanage and the connection is of course John seeing it from his house from the window from me Aunt Mimi's house which can only have been just over there Ben Love Avenue there's this housing estate now and I don't know if he snuck in the back entrance because there's a back way there or if he would come round the front and then come through the red gates but these are the original red gates which were stolen as she said in the 70s did she say i'll have to go back on the audio and they were being sold for scrap and then it was reported in the news and somebody discovered it and handed them back I love John for his um, ethos on peace and love and why can't people just live in peace but this is a this is amazing if you're in Liverpool £10.75 gets you through the exhibition that's if you listen to the audio tour and it would make more sense because you get all the pictures and you've got that big um, screen with Paul talking and I suppose you're listening to it but I chose not to do that just want to walk around I wonder what they're doing here do you think they're going to build a bandstand for sergeant pepper it could actually be you could have people here yeah actually salvation army band that would make sense wouldn't it because the salvation army do the brass band i mentioned that in my um my love of martha my dear you know and sort of the what it conjures up this has made it worthwhile all the little snippy bits <laughs> it's like I've come all the way up from Kent just to visit the Strawberry Fields exhibition. So in this unassuming little district of Wavertree is Arnold Grove, which is unadopted, which means that the council don't maintain the roads, or at least they didn't in the olden days. But in these little terraced houses, number 12, George was born. Where is it down here? It's quite um, tiny, it's a two up, two down, nothing much really. And I can only imagine that they get lots and lots of people coming, standing outside the house. I read a quote by George and he said, try and imagine the soul entering the womb of a woman living at number 12 Arnold Grove. There were all the barrage balloons and the Germans bombing Liverpool. All that was going on. I sat outside the house a couple of years ago imagining 1943, nipping through the spiritual world, the astral plane, 
getting back into the body in that house that really is strange when you consider the whole planet all the planets there may be on a spiritual level how do I come into that family in that house at that time and who am I anyway a very very spiritual person old George so number 12 here we go past his front door and it's a pseudonym that George adopted um, you know when he was checking into hotels he would be Mr Arnold Grove <laughs> there's also a story that he um, was performing on stage but that record companies didn't want you know the the artists other than the, the starred artist performing and um, he was introduced on stage was it a deep purple concert or something like that um, and and who are you <laughs> said Gillian 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 not a big follower of deep purple he said oh Arnold Grove from Liverpool <laughs> let's go and find his other home so having lived at Arnold Grove till he was about six George moved to Upton Green which is a very quiet kind of cul-de-sac and he moved into number 25 with his mother and father and family and lived here till he was well 12 years till he was 18 and then moved out so that he could become famous <laughs> but there's a great picture of him holding his guitar whether I can superimpose a picture of it yeah it said that he had a, a happy life here um, for the 12 years that was he was here and that his bus route was only a short walk from the house and he would catch the bus to school with with Paul so with that I think I've, I'll wrap the video up it's been a, a fabulous day and actually quite emotional now I've still missed off two locations and there are probably even a few more um, certainly nine Newcastle Road was missed the Casbar again because I'm now in speak and the Casbar's the other end of the town but I'm kind of inspired to come back and do a third but this time kind of charting the birth of the quarry men I've been doing all the research for this video and that kind of came to mind I thought you know what has anyone done like the whole quarry men thing so I might come excuse me I might come back and we'll do a second one a third one but make it more quarry men than Beatles but obviously it evolves into Beatles anyway so what I, was, what I will say is thank you so much for watching it's been a lot of fun give the video a thumbs up it will certainly help the algorithms and it'll help my channel you know it gives it a boost if you found it at all entertaining just a quick thumbs up if you're not already subscribed hit the subscribe button and the bell notification because when I release future content you will get notified it's easy peasy <laughs> if you didn't like it hit the dislike button in fact hit it twice just to be sure but actually don't hit the dislike if you didn't like it just move on to the next video I shall say thanks for watching and I will see you in another video bye for now